build their structure, their living, and if the area or the water around them is um, more acid, it's less or it's more difficult to create those structures. Uh, other parts related to climate change is there that there is a decrease of oxygen in the water, which also results in uh, a more difficult area for most organisms to live in, not for all, but, but for many of them. And that the uh, water is warming up. So uh, organisms which don't like the warmer water tend to go on the northern uh, hemisphere northwards, on the southern hemisphere north, uh, southwards. So if you look at some predictions into the future, there is going, or they predict a huge area around the tropics without any life of fish at all. And then some other challenges for the ocean are the, the challenges on land, which have their impact on the ocean. As there are more people who want to have more food, especially protein food. I, about half of the world population take the main part of their proteins from the sea, from the ocean. So if the population increases, there will be also more need for, uh, for fisheries and those kind of things. So that also asks of the ocean to produce more of this kind of food. And the ocean has to deal with the waste we put um, mm. into the ocean. And it's sometimes it's deliberately, but most of the part it's undeliberately. It's because, because people are not really aware of which impacts it has on the ocean. And it, it is either by uh, sewage uh, from, from large coastal cities, by runoff of nutrients from land, uh, but also with um, the largest amount of oil which is in the ocean is not by a big catastrophe like Deepwater Horizon explosion. It's because of the little amounts of oil which get into the ground in the groundwater by people spilling a bit of fuel when they fuel up or when they wash their cars and or when it rains and the oil on the road is being washed away towards the groundwater. All those amounts add up to a far bigger amount of oil in the ocean than uh, what a huge explosion uh, does. So you could summarize this as how to meet the basic needs of, of, of people on Earth while restoring the life support system, where you could see or could look at the ocean as a, large, uh, as a life support system. And what we at SCT would, look, uh, would like to do in the foresight study is to look at um, the possibilities the oceans have, like the ecosystem surfaces, and how they can contribute to, um, to tackle the societal grand challenges uh, just described. So what might the ocean in the future bring or take? Then we come to what you know more from your description. Um, as part of our research, we will focus on different areas for the ocean as a living space or a source of energy, uh, and probably some other uh, uh, sources, so to say, as well. But I'd like to go or just briefly touch upon the three mentioned in your description. The ocean as a living space is not a new idea to everyone. One famous book by Jules Verne, uh, 20,000 miles beneath the sea, you have this, this Captain Nemo, which has built, it was conceived of in the uh, 19th century, so before we actually had the, the underwater sea boats. Um, but uh, it was conceived uh, by Jules Verne that this Captain Nemo uh, didn't like to live on land anymore and he built this large submarine and lived with his people uh, in this submarine and crossed all the oceans uh, as a way of living and well like especially the, the, the upper picture sh showed he had this huge um, uh, di dining area he has a huge uh, window screen to look outside and then had all his books around him so he really used it as his a moving living space uh, in the ocean. If we 
look at what is reality already, you could in a way say that people taking these huge cruises <laughs> around the world uh, over the oceans are also using the ocean as a living space. And this is a picture of uh, one of the largest cruise boats, the Oasis of the Seas. And well, just to compare, you see this, this marine boat next to it. So it's really huge. I believe it has like 11 or 12 stories high. It has its cinema, it has, it has its swimming pool. You can um, do all kinds of stuff you can do on land on this ship while it's cruising. So it's ama amazing by its uh, dimensions. And then we also have people today who dream about uh, living on the ocean. And one example of floating city is, uh, is this one. And I don't remember exactly the organization who put it here. So I hope they wrote it down. Carolina, do you remember? Because you posted this on Facebook. I think it was, if you are remember, I don't know exactly what it is. It was like Club Stead, something like this. Uh, yeah, you are floating city. Yeah, it's floating city. It's, it's called the Lily Pad by uh, Vincent Taillebeau. I believe he's a Belgian architect. And I think, well, as far as I've seen, he's, he's one of, uh, uh, I would say the first, but that's not actually true. There are, there are some um, uh, current architects who are looking, especially, I think, for the Asian countries and how to use the ocean surface water area as a living space, be it either floating uh, or connected to the ocean. Then another one, the ocean to explore. We can also come back to this Jules Verne with an image like this, for where he's standing in front of this large screen and seeing this giant octopus and being amazed by uh, what he sees. And then we have um, these kind of um, drawings by people in the Middle Ages who, who started to cross the seas and they talked about these giant sea monsters uh, which <coughs> might actually be bigger mammals which lived uh, then or even further in the past uh, in the high seas. But they were really amazed and because they didn't know what it was they were actually scared about the oceans. and with the more knowledge we have about the oceans, the less scared we come about and also probably a bit reluctant about it. But we also have our current uh, was way of looking at the ocean and that is by using techniques to, to observe uh, the oceans, being it, it's not that, that clear I think from there, but w we can use satellites, we can use uh, the ships, we can use uh, buoys to, at a certain uh, place in the ocean, take all kinds of samples of the seawater to, to look for uh, the oxygen uh, volume or the temperature or, or the salinity. And there are other ways of, of getting um, well, fact knowledge about the ocean at a certain uh, uh, place. So it contributes to a larger knowledge base about the ocean, but it's more about getting the data. And mm -hmm. there's still a huge going on into building that into bigger information and, and knowledge systems about how does this ocean system or the ocean as a part of Earth system actually work. Mm -hmm. But that's one mm -hmm. way of exploring from a scientific point of view. You can also explore it more as a tourist, as a person itself. And this is in a luxurious resort, I think it's, it's near the Maldives, um, where they actually built this restaurant underneath the sea level. I think it's five or 12 meters deep. And it, it will, you have to earn a lot, I think, or have a lot of money mm -hmm. to go there. Um, but then you can enjoy the sharks and other fishes swimming around you uh, when you have your own uh, dinner. And then the last one, the ocean as a source of energy. I, it's one which is, I think, closest to uh, people's mind if you look from the perspective of the oil and gas industry. I think the challenge, or I would like to propose it as a challenge to look at different ways of using the ocean for energy, especially a more renewable or even a sustainable source as renewable is not mm -hmm. the same as sustainable. 
One way is to use the, thermic, uh, the thermal difference between the higher water of the sea and uh, the deeper area, because deep down it's about 4 centigrade Celsius, to, uh, and the upper part, especially in the tropics, it might be 27 or even higher degrees, and you can use this thermal difference to create energy. It's called OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. Mm -hmm. Or another way, possible way, is we talked already a bit about this the L day uh, to use. Just to get you started, if uh, you haven't found it so far yeah. uh, on this uh, letter. And then before finishing off, I would highlight some facts about the oceans, which might be a starting point for you also to elaborate on to see future possibilities. I think. One main thing about the oceans is that it's not the 2D uh, area which we see uh, when we see pictures about it. It has this third dimension going into the deep and well, you don't, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to uh, take notice of the different parts which are indicated there, but my main message would be it's 3D. You have the deep which is at average uh, a small four kilometers deep and the deepest point is about 11 kilometers deep. And it moves. The water isn't still in one point, it moves around the globe. So it distributes the warmth or the cold, but it also distributes nu uh, nutrients, it uh, distributes food, oxygen. So it's, it's 4D, you could say. Then some other facts, well, we already crossed, uh, uh, came upon two of those. And the third one is it's kind of a no man's land. All the area on land is claimed by countries. And you have some conventions which, uh, which say, well, up to 200 miles into the sea, it's called the economic zones, um, which are also part of a country. But beyond that, it's of no one. There are some institutions which kind of try to regulate that area. But as we uh, learn about the richness of the oceans, about the floor, about what's in the water column, uh, more and more countries are interested in claiming this part of the unclaimed sea. So for example, um, you see that the, uh, a country like Portugal um, has claimed a lot of land next to their uh, isles in the uh, Atlantic Ocean so that it could take minerals from there. And there is this huge debate going on about the North Pole, whether it's part of the continental shelf of, for example, Russia or Greenland. So you, you have this large area or potential area of conflict which can attribute to this global shift in power as well. And then we have the ocean as, as weather maker. And to give you an impression, the, the, uh, the Earth's surface takes up the solar energy. And as so much of Earth's surface is actually ocean surface, it helps store energy taken out from the sun. And the way it does depends on what the surface of the ocean looks like. If it's uh, covered by ice, then it's white and then it reflects most of the sun and with that most of the heat, of the heat, so it's 80%. But if it's open water, then it's kind of dark and it sucks up 95% of the heat into the water. And that is one explanation to why, what are the effects of warming up of the ocean and the effects on climate because of the mighting, uh, mighting else the ocean gets warmer and even more ice melts and the ocean gets even warmer and kind of reinforces the, tre the temperature rise on Earth. And then we have ocean life, which is far and far and far older than the land life, so to say. Life on Earth developed in the ocean before it went onto the land area. And there is this huge variety of, of living creatures, being it plants or, or animals, from very tiny, li like bacteria, to very large mammals, uh, like whales. 
and then if you look at the the seafloor you will not still have 